Welcome to IREB Resistance Radio, where we discuss the resistance work going on in Minnesota's 2nd Congressional District. IREB is an indivisible group formed after the 2016 election in opposition to an executive that we feared was going to do grave damage to our country. As our fears have been proven out, so has our membership grown. We attract people from across the political spectrum, but make no mistake, we are united as a progressive force in Minnesota's politics. Join us on our Facebook page, search for The Indivisible Resistance of Egan and Burnsville. I read podcast number 13. We're here today with a couple of new friends that we've recently met in the resistance movement, but first a couple of uh, announcements. Um, as always, we have uh, funding is available if you want to help us out with the work that we're doing. You can find us at GoFundMe. Um, uh, look for the Indivisible Resistance of Egan and Burns Hill. And another announcement, uh, we do have a web page coming up, irebradio.com. Uh, so uh, look for that to uh, be uh, popping up real soon. Um, but back to our guests, uh, today we've got with us Jeremy Drucker and uh, uh, Donald McFarland, both working with an organization that we've just uh, kind of become friends with recently and been working with um, uh, in this area, uh, uh, Protect Our Care. Um, these guys, uh, and I want to. We're going to dig in a little bit about their organization a little bit more, and you know what they're here and what they're doing, and the kind of things that they they uh, are here to talk about. But um, uh, the the first thing that we always like to do in IREB is, is is ask everybody about you know what what got them involved in politics. And so, um, Jeremy, you know, this is kind of the icebreaker. We want to get to know you a little bit. Tell me a little bit about what was that thing that made you stand up and get involved in politics, and then talk a little bit about yourself. And then after you're done, we'll ask Donald uh, the same question. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having us on. And thank you to, you know, all the folks at IREB. You guys have been great partners over the last month, month and a half. It's been great working with you guys. So, um, so thank you. Um, and my moment, the moment for me that really kind of um, made me stand up and, and kind of be, you know, be involved in politics and uh, to be, you know, be part of that was, um, I remember I was uh, probably in kindergarten and I was uh, watching the 1984 Democratic National Convention with my parents and I was wearing a little red, you know, onesie uh, and I remember seeing Walter Mondale on there and my mom talking about how great this guy was and how he was, you know, an ethical, honorable man who was working to, you know, help people with ladders up out of poverty, was working to take care of seniors and protect them uh, and was working for civil rights and was talking, you know, about the the record of Democrats in the civil rights movement. And I just remember feeling like I want to be on that team. Like those are the guys that, um, you know, that, that speak to things that I care about. And so, you know, so I've been kind of was political, um, you know, kind of growing up um, in different ways, though not super active. Um, you know, I worked on my first campaign in 2006 for Congressman Keith Ellison. Um, you know, that was sort of um, kind of my moment where I really became active and engaged and involved in, um, in, in politics actively. Um, and yeah, and I just, I walked in one day early on and uh, said, what can I do to help? And they said, can you write a letter? I said, sure, I can write a letter. And I wrote a letter. And then they said, can you fill out a questionnaire? I said, I can fill out a questionnaire. And so I researched it and I filled out the questionnaire and then kept doing one little more things, little more things. And before I knew it, I was driving the candidate around and, um, you know, it was, uh, he was the first uh, Muslim to ever be elected uh, member of Congress at the time. So there was a lot of buzz around that. And I just remember thinking that, you know, this is, you know, this is something that I could do for, do for a career. And so, um, you know, but I kind of took baby steps to get there though. I, um, you know, originally, you know, I moved to, after college, uh, I grew up in Minnesota, um, but I uh, moved to New York after college, uh, went to the University of St. Thomas, then moved to New York for grad school. Uh, and I was going to be an English literature professor. That was going to be what I was going to do with my life. And um, because uh, so I studied English literature in New York, never thought I'd come home. And then one day uh, I got a call from my dad that my mom was really sick and he needed me to come home. And so I came home and I finished my master's degree from home and uh, finished my master's thesis one day and walked into Car the uh, then state representative Keith Ellison's office the next day um, and volunteered for that campaign for a while. Uh, after that campaign, I uh, decided that I wasn't, I was going to finish my academic career. I was going to become an English literature professor, um, moved back to New York, but as circumstances would have it, the uh, minute I got off the plane, there was a call waiting for me from the Speaker of the New York City Council's office asking me if I could help out down with the Speaker of the New York City Council and her press office. Wow. So 
Yeah. So I ended up doing both for a while. I was teaching a full class load, uh, uh, taking a full class load and then working 35 hours a week for the Speaker of the New York City Council. Uh, and I did that for three years um, until I eventually just couldn't couldn't do all three things anymore. And so I kind of had to make a choice and I decided to kind of follow the political career where I ended up working for uh, a guy named Bill Thompson, who was running for New York City mayor against Michael Bloomberg. He was a Democrat. Um, so I was his research director. Um, and then after that campaign, I moved back to Minnesota in 2010. Uh, I worked for Matt Intenza when he ran for governor. I was his communications director and policy director. And then when he lost the uh, the primary in 2010, I went to work for Governor Dayton, uh, or then Senator Dayton, soon to be Governor Dayton. And, you know, I've been with the Dayton organization off and on ever since in multiple different roles in his office. Um, I started working in healthcare uh, at the Department of Human Services. Uh, I worked at Minsure for a while. Uh, and I really kind of learned about how these programs are so vital um, for so many people. Um, you know, Medicaid serves almost a million Minnesotans uh, every year. Um, you know, the tax credits that people get through Minsure really help people afford insurance who couldn't afford it otherwise. Um, and so seeing up close how all of those things work, I really um, got a sense of how important those programs were. And, um, you know, I left the administration and have done some different things since then with the environment, especially with protecting the boundary waters. But uh, healthcare is always kind of near and dear to my heart. So um, glad to glad to be working on it with you guys and trying to protect, uh, protect the gains that we've made and, uh, you know, ensure that we don't go backwards. Well, and you you have a, a just an abundance of energy. That's actually one of the one of the <laughs> things that I, you know I've known you a short time, and that, and I and it's like the you're like the thing that you give off the most is that abundance of energy. And you're an especially nice dresser. I have to. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know. Thank you, Mark. That's so yeah. kind. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, just a couple of observations. So yeah. I pass that on. So I've All got right. you fooled. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. Donald, Donald McFarland. Now, he, here's another guy. This guy's pretty interesting. So um, I, I like you, Don. I, I, I've, been, <laughs> I've enjoyed our time and our chat. So uh, tell me about your uh, uh, thing that got you involved in politics and you know what, what you've done with yourself since then. Well, I'm going to stay involved until I can dress as well as Jeremy does. So <laughs> there's, there's that. Um, I, you know, I, I'm old, so my story could go on for 100 years. I'll try not to bore you, but... Um, I'll, so, you know, my parents were involved in politics at a very, very local level in suburban Philadelphia. I grew up in Philly and we moved to the suburbs when I was about 13 and they were really involved. And I tell the story only because it's, it, it's what I do now. And so long story short, the county was going to relocate the prison into our like almost literal backyard. And it was it, back then in that the part of suburban Philly, there was a lot of land. So there's a lot of places it could have gone. So. You know, we organized the community and long story short, in the high school gym, we had this huge rally and the news was there. And that night at 11, I was on ABC News and I was like 15 or something years old, 16, whatever. And I was like, hey, look, I'm on the news. And who knew? But, you know, like a million years later, I'd be a communications guy and be on ABC News more. Um, so it was a bit of a precursor to my eventual career, I guess. Um, they built the prison there, by the way. Still there. Um, <laughs> yeah. So there, you know, but you still organize. Uh, organize, organize, organize. Um, I grew up in Philly, you know, in the 90s, I worked for uh, Clinton Gore and um, uh, in Philly, and it was a lot of fun. And after 12 years of Reagan Bush, uh, me and one of my friends, best friends, we decided like we just couldn't, couldn't sort of just stand by. So we just, you know, we found out where their office was and we went to it and said, hi, we want to help. And um, so we did. Um, and it was it was crazy, crazy fun. It was a crazy good time. The night before election day, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton came to Philadelphia and stayed overnight because they started election day that year in '92 in uh, in Philly. And so we got to shake their hands at like two in the morning. Um, so that was a super cool memory. Um, and then I went back to my life. I got to go to the inauguration. It was fun, and got to go to the White House, and it was fun and just cool, cool stuff. Very cool. It was you know, kid in the candy shop. Anyway. Um, Flash forward to 2000, I was living in Florida and I thought it might be close that year. So I volunteered to help. Um, turns out it was close. And at one point I was um, in Volusia County counting ballots for the presidential recount. That was a surreal kind of time. Um, but um, 
that didn't end so well either for us. Actually. No. We My stories getting, don't end well a lot of times. Well, we, we keep getting um, beat up with these elections that we were Yeah, should... you know, there's a, there's a theme. Although Bill Clinton became president, which was cool. So back in 92. So, um, so then, um, long story short, that's when I, and then after that, I started working in politics. There were some, there were some folks involved with that race in Central Florida that had roots here in Minnesota. And they said, you know, you should come and do this. You should work. You should do this. You should do this for a living. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, you know, do it as your job. I said, well, people get paid for this. And they said, you're not getting paid for this now. And I said, no, I'm not going to be paid for this. So they're like, well, first you're crazy. And second, you should be. So there you go. Um, I, I wound up in Minnesota a couple of years later after running around the country, uh, doing various organizing jobs and did wind up here. But I want to flash forward to 2000 and, um, 2008, when President Obama was elected. So, you know, one of his first important pieces of legislation was health care reform. And so, um, along with a couple others, but I worked on that, um, on passing the Affordable Care Act. And my job was in North Dakota. It wasn't in Minnesota. We had, pretty, we had two pretty reliable um, votes at the time, or at least one reliable vote and one that wasn't going to happen. Um, but we... Um, needed um, the um, the votes of the uh, Democratic senators in North Dakota. So I got sent there, and that was my job. And we passed it, and it wasn't easy, and it took a year, but we did it. Um, and it's not perfect, and it's never been perfect. I don't think anybody, even at the time, thought it would be perfect, but we knew we needed health care reform. I remember Hillary Clinton talking about that in 1992 when I first got involved in, in a bigger campaign. Um, and so you know, that brings us really to where we are now, which is protect our care. Um, and, you know, this organization was founded because, you know, after Donald Trump's election, um, Republicans have been trying to turn the clock back on health care. And um, we worked really hard to get where we are. The Republican agenda is you know, it's pretty simple. And that's repeal the Affordable Care Act at all costs. Um, regardless of whether we have a plan to replace it or not, repeal it at all costs. And so we know now what that means. Uh, well, I'm sure we'll talk about that a little more in the next few minutes. But I'm glad I did that work back then. I'm proud of it. I'm glad I'm doing this work now. I'm proud of it. Because healthcare is the most important component of this election. I think voters are saying that as well. And I know just as a guy, as a single guy with two kids, it's important to me. And that's what I hear from voters all over the state of Minnesota is this is the most important thing we can talk about right now is healthcare. I agree. <clears throat> and and uh, I'm, I'm so uh, grateful for the work that you guys are doing, bringing that, uh, you know, topic here to Minnesota and, you know, helping us get that across. We've been, you know, IREB uh, has been, you know, pretty active in that space. You know, we, we're trying to uh, bring attention to that. And speaking of IREB, uh, joining us tonight again uh, is uh, uh, Sarah Chapman. Sarah, how are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for coming and sitting on. She's here to keep these other two guys uh, honest. If you got any questions <laughs> for them as they talk, you know, jump right in. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, now getting back to protect our care. So that's kind of what you guys are doing here. You know, we, this, uh, and I've got some signs here. Um, uh, we, we, we've, we've, uh, partnered with you guys on several events now, um, with regard to this. So you guys had that national bus tour. Jeremy, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So the, the bus tour, it's called Care Force One. It's the name of the bus and it's literally going around the country. Um, you know, we're holding events. Um, we meaning protect our care, holding events, uh, in all across the country. So it was, we were in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, earlier in the day, uh, on Monday before, uh, the event, uh, in Minnesota. And then they, that night there, that afternoon, right after that, they went straight to North Dakota, uh, and they've kept kind of moving West and then they're looping around and ending up in Florida. I think they were in Florida today, actually. Um, and so, and really just, it's about getting the, getting the word out. I mean, the beagle knows, I mean, it's important that, uh, you know, that people understand, um, what's at stake in this election. And, and they understand that there's people that behind all of the rhetoric, 
behind, um, you know, all the facts and figures that people throw out is that there's people's lives that are at stake here. Um, you know, there's people with pre-existing conditions who won't get coverage if the affordable care is repealed. Um, there's people who will be priced out of coverage if um, the Republican plan is put in place. I mean, one thing that people don't know, um, or a lot of people aren't aware of the Republican replacement plan is that it would increase the costs of uh, health insurance for people who are sick, for, uh, for older Americans, um, you know, it would allow states to take away guaranteed protections for pre-existing conditions. And so all of the protections that we have become accustomed to, um, you know, over the last six, seven years, the Affordable Care Act could, could go away. Um, and so, you know, the whole point of the bus tour is to really amplify those voices so that people understand they can hear people's stories. They can hear, um, they can hear from people what's at stake. Um, and they don't have to, you know, they don't have to listen to, you know, you know, false TV ads and, and all that other stuff, but they can hear it straight from people. What is, well, it's, so I, you know, I mean, I've, I have candidates on here and so I try to not to complain too much about the other side, but what is, the, these guys are lying. They're just outright lying on the other side about, you know, the, the, the way they misstate things. It's, it's, uh, are, are they ever going to be, be I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, look, it's, fr it's really, fr I mean, they have a, you know, they don't have a good role model in the White House when it comes to truth. Uh, you know, I mean, I think, you know, the, the leader that they have in the White House and the leader of their party has really lowered the bar on discourse in this country so low um, that, you know, it's almost impossible not to step over even just on accident. And so, you know, I think, and they also know that it's really bad politics. Um, you know, not only is it terrible policy, not only is it terrible for people, it's terrible politics. Uh, and so because it's terrible politics, they know that they can't, they can't win if they tell you the truth. Uh, and so they're not going to do it. Uh, and so it's frustrating, but that's why it's important that, you know, folks like IREV, folks like Protect Our Care and other people, you know, other candidates, um, you know, who are, who are fighting for health care, keep them accountable, hold them accountable. Okay. So um, but getting back to the bus that Jeremy mentioned, you know, that was, a, it's still sort of touring the, the country and it's, it was a great opportunity um, for us to sort of showcase what we're talking about. I wish it was going to swing back a couple more times before election day. I wish it could swing back through the 18 or so really pivotal congressional house districts in this country twice more, um, because, um, two of them are right here, uh, in, right. uh, in the suburbs of, of the twin cities, one being the second. And so, um, there will be more uh, opportunity as we move forward and we'll make sure that we let people know about that as, as, as the, um, as the occasion arises, but, um, don't mistake that in any way to mean that we're not going to up until election day hold Jason Lewis accountable for his record in the last two years on healthcare, because it's been bad. Jeremy talked about it. You know, there's a bad role model and there's some, and in the white house, but let's face it. Um, Jason Lewis doesn't need a role model like that anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Republican agenda has been, even before Jason Lewis got there, has really been about sabotage when it comes to health care. Mm -hmm. And it's been, as I mentioned at the outset, sort of, you know, repeal the Affordable Care Act at all costs. And so then it became repeal and replace. Well, they decided, here's an idea. Let's replace it with um, the American Health Care Act which was a joke. It was essentially saying that insurance companies could sell junk plans to people for all the, and, and not cover the things that Jeremy just mentioned, not cover pre-existing conditions, allows insurance companies to jack up the prices of, of folks over 50 up to five, six, seven times. Um, and then there's pre-existing, but the pre-existing condition thing is really the most important thing that we can talk about because I don't know very many people who don't have something that would be considered a pre-existing condition. And look, insurance companies can determine that pregnancy is a pre-existing condition. So it's a pretty fluid term when we talk about pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. um, but think about it. I mean, you know, just everything from asthma to diabetes. I mean, there's so many things that can be, can be termed a pre-existing condition. And so therefore, um, insurance companies can either not have to cover you or 
cover you and not have to pay for those healthcare related yeah. uh, issues that you need the healthcare for in the first place. And that is sort of the catch, the catch 22, the awful insidious catch 22 of the, of the Republicans plan is that they can, they still want to allow people to think that they have somehow gotten coverage that will work for their families and take care of their families when they need it. When in fact they know for well it won't. Right. And, and it's, it's, and that's a big part of what protect our care is all about. And people need to really understand that. And they need to understand what the Republicans are actually talking about. Yep. That, and, you know, and one other thing too, and I just want to um, you know, make sure we make this point as well, because all of these policies kind of come together in a way. Um, and I want to say a little bit about the Republican tax bill that was passed um, because I think, you know, there's the immediate threat in terms of repealing the Affordable Care Act that people have to be aware of and we need to be aware of. But there's the other component of it, too, which is, and Donald mentioned this, which is that, you know, they want to, if they can't repeal it outright, they want to sabotage it. Right. And one of the ways that they're sabotaging it is, as Donald mentioned, with these junk plans. The other way that they're sabotaging it, though, is by their basically stealing funding from it. And they're stealing funding from it. Um, in a, in a backwards way in which they give huge tax breaks to the wealthy, to corporations. They're going to, they're blowing a multi-trillion dollar hole in the deficit. And now they're talking about how we have a deficit problem and we have to you know close the deficit. And the only way to close the deficit is to get a handle on Medicaid, Medicare, and social security. Mm -hmm. So already they're setting and you know, and the white house economic advisor has said this, Paul Ryan has said this, Mitch McConnell alluded to it yesterday. Yeah. The only way that they can, you know, they're changing the conversation and they're saying, well, now in order for us to get our finances in order, you know, we have to take away these essential protections and these, this essential safety net that has underpinned our society for the last 50 years. And that's Medicare, Medicaid and Social Security. And so, you know, what they're trying to set up is a situation in which they've gotten their tax cuts and now they're going to pay for it off the backs of seniors, off of the poor uh, off of retirees, people have paid in for their entire lives into this system that, you know, had made a promise to them. And and they're looking to, to break that, you know, so that they can pay for these tax cuts to the very wealthy that disproportionately affected the wealthy. And so I think it's just really important to call that out because I don't know if that's being called out enough right now. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right about that. So I have one question for you guys, and, you know, that, that we're, we're getting close to the end here, so we'll have to probably make this our last you know, the the rural question. I mean, you know, we, you know, they we 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 seem to have, have difficulty figuring out like what what do people want, um, you know, outside of the metro area. It's the same thing that we want, isn't it? I mean, they want the same health care. They, I mean, what do you guys know about that in in your polling and so on? Well, so I, you know, the polling, you know, what we see in polling across the state is that health care is the number one issue. Um, there are pockets around greater Minnesota in which other issues once in a while pop up, you know, immigration um, in a couple places, um, you know, one in one county, it's taxes, but by and large, it's still healthcare. The challenges to, to rural um, in greater Minnesota, the healthcare challenges are a little different than in the Metro. Um, you know, the big challenge that they have out there is um, just provider networks. Um, you know, they don't have as many doctors. They have shortages of psychiatrists in particular, um, and they have to drive really long ways uh, in order to get care. And so um, the provider networks that they have are um, are a challenge, and, we, and that's something that needs to be worked on. Um, but it's not going to get fixed by anything that the Republicans are proposing. No. Um, you know, I mean, and, 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 so the, and there's the affordability issue as well. I mean, when you look at the cost of health insurance premiums, they're much higher in greater Minnesota, particularly in southeastern Minnesota. Um, and so, and that's an issue that needs to be addressed as well. But, um, but, they, but they're facing the same issues fundamentally that we are. Um, and that's, you know, access to care and affordability. Uh, and there are plans out there that, uh, and, they're, and they've been proposed by, by, on the state level, by Tim Walls, at the, at the federal level, by, um, by Democrats there, um, that can fix and improve what we have now and fix those issues. But, um, but it, while we're constantly fighting this rear guard action against repeal, it's hard to get traction on those things. Yeah. Yeah. Don, do you got any final comments before we wrap it up? 
No, I, that, I think Jeremy really summed up, the, you know, sort of the rural America part of it. I mean, you know, think about small, smaller communities and, and smaller hospitals. You know, if the people that live in those communities have junk plans that don't cover them when they need it, what happens when the bill comes and they can't pay it? When the hospital sends the bill and it can't be paid, it doesn't get paid because people don't have that kind of money. And so then these hospitals start suffering and suffering and suffering. And that's a big part of the strain that we're finding in rural, in rural Minnesota and rural America is all these things are just, are, again, there's a sabotaging the healthcare system. You know, it, it, it's not just, it's not just all of us who are buying healthcare plans, but it sabotages the system. That's why doctors, nurses, everybody was, that's why everybody got on board with the Affordable Care Act because everybody knew the system needed to be changed. The system needed to be fixed because of all these other things that were happening. And so, you know, turning the clock back like the Republicans are doing is also doing an enormous amount of harm to, to small hospitals and, 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 and clinics and, and smaller communities in Minnesota and in the country. Yeah, among other things. All right. Well, thank you both. Thank you all three for uh, coming on. We're uh, reached the end of this episode. Um, uh, Don Mc, uh, McFarland, uh, Jeremy Drucker, uh, Sarah Chapman, and myself, Mark Fasconi. Thank you all, and I uh, hope to talk to you guys again real soon. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. 